So as usual, the Democrats have given us heaps of crap to sift through on this Monday, but let's start with this. Zelensky, you know I can't stand that little twerp, you all well know that, but he's given me and hopefully you yet another reason to question his integrity, his intentions, his moral compass. Zelensky has taken the liberty of appointing this woman, Marina Ambromovich, as an ambassador for rebuilding schools in Ukraine. She is dubbed a performance artist, but her art appears to be heavy on the side of sick, twisted, and satanic, and light on the art. She's also known for her 1987 performance titled Spirit Cooking, which involves using pig's blood to write recipes on walls. But don't worry, she says it was nothing more than artistic expression. She sounds like someone who should be in an asylum or in a straitjacket or in the Conjuring movie uh, horror series, but tasked with rebuilding schools in Ukraine, I don't think so. But I'm sure we'll be paying for her salary, too. The Ukraine bar tab is open, and while the people of East Palestine, Ohio, you know, the American people, could very well still be drinking toxic chemicals, you'll be happy to know our president is dedicated to the clean water project once again in Ukraine. That's why we brought together a coalition of more than 50 countries, more than 50 countries, to help Ukraine defend itself. And uh, that's critical. And that's why, together with our partners in Ukraine, we have provided humanitarian aid as well as tens of millions of people with food, clean water, and so much more. And that's why, that's why we've begun the process of formalizing our long-term commitment to Ukraine security alongside the G7 and with other partners. And that's why we supported just and lasting peace, one that respects Ukrainian sovereignty and its territorial integrity. Territorial integrity, huh? What a concept. Is this what territorial integrity looks like to Joe? Or does he just not care because it's our territory and he as well as it have no integrity? America last, America invaded. Put that on a t-shirt and sell it at the DNC convention. <laughs> but joining me now with her take on that and so much more is former director of press advance for the Obama administration, Joanna Masca. Joanna, it's great to have you. And last time on your podcast, we mixed it up a little bit. We talked a lot about Ukraine. So knowing I was going to have you as a guest today, I had to lead with that. So I want to get your initial thoughts on this person that Zelensky would like to uh, help rebuild schools in Ukraine. A good move, a good pick. Tommy, it is wonderful to join you on this lovely Monday. Uh, I have seen kind of mixed results in partnering with artists in general. They're uncontrollable and they have their own tactics and their own reason why they're getting involved in these things. I wasn't seeing confirmation that Zelensky did ask her to be an ambassador. I saw her saying that she was invited to be an ambassador. So I'm going to wait for that confirmation. But uh, certainly, you know, she's been pretty public about never wanting to have children, taking every measure to not have children. So I'm not sure that her uh, meshing with protecting kids in Ukraine is the right move. And like I said, you know, as someone who we partnered with artists in the Obama world, and sometimes we would find that that was probably a bad idea because we didn't maybe get the full vet results because they would go off and do their own thing after we had some sort of a partnership with them. And so you can live to regret those decisions. Yeah, I can't imagine an artist really serving much of a purpose within an administration other than maybe Christmas decorations. But it's just interesting to me, Joanna, because, you know, the right has a lot of theories, some of them maybe conspiracy theories about the left, you know, pushing for Satanism or being very dark and twisted. But then they just keep giving fuel to this fire when they keep bringing these people about that fit that description to a T. I mean, talk about throwing out red meat, quite literally. That's what they're doing by even bringing up this person's name. It just gives a lot of fodder for my conversation. I Like I said, I wasn't seeing any confirmation, certainly nothing from the U.S. entities saying that she was going to be an ambassador. I, I mean, I agree with you. It's a really questionable move. Um, now, whether she wanted to say that she is an ambassador, look, she's been pretty consistent that she's against, um, you know, Vladimir Putin having grown up in that region, knowing the risk that is associated with Putin going after artists. I mean, I'm sure that she is very fervently 
on the side of Ukraine. But again, you know, serving in an official capacity, normally an artist like her and with her, you know, positions that she's uh, put herself in, it's probably not going to mix well with government. So, uh, you know, whether she's saying that she's going to be an ambassador, I don't know that the left is the ones who would be pushing that. Certainly hope not. Yeah, I certainly hope not as well. I'm just quite frankly sick of sending anything to Ukraine, money, ambassadors, clean water projects, green energy initiatives. I'm just really tired of it. You and I talked about this at length last time, but I want to kind of couple that up with another discussion, and that's the border invasion, you know, in our own country. Joanna, I know that you're seeing these images like I am, or at least I hope you are, and you've got to be thinking the same thing that most Americans are, that this is unsustainable when you've got thousands coming over in a day. We know that even the governor of New York is now saying, please don't come. We know Mayor Eric Adams said it was going to destroy New York City. We're in a bad spot, and it's hard to argue that the Biden administration didn't get us here. But what's your take? So Gavin Newsom was actually out in New York last week and also addressed this as a border governor. And he also said he's seen the problem. He's been sending National Guard to the border. I think every American should recognize that this is a significant issue. Um, What led us here, Tommy, I believe is inaction on any reform for our immigration policies. I think there's significant need to reform, to have, you know, the reason why we bring people to this country is so that they can work, so that they can, you know, help us build our economy. And there is reforms that we could do that the Trump administration, the Obama administration, the Bush administration have been advocating for. We are at a position where, you know, the world's instability coupled with this for whatever reason, people believe that the border is open. And I would say none of us should be saying that because it is not supposed to be open. Um, But because people are coming here, we're getting, you know, 2 million people trying to get to America and from all over the world. And that is a significant risk. Now, when we have no actual laws to process them, the Biden administration ends up having to follow the laws on the books which means that they've got you know, a situation where when people come here claiming asylum status, they have to be able to hear them out on that asylum status. We are still the country that has been the beacon of hope for the world. And I think we need to reform the laws so that we're not in this position. But each governor, whether it's Governor Newsom, whether it's Governor Abbott, they're all dealing with this. Governor DeSantis, on their own. And that's a problem. We need Congress to step in. We need an entire reform policy to be like really prioritized by both parties sitting down together. And we haven't had that. Right. I think, though, what a lot of us want to see is is stop the bleeding. I mean, there is a reason why apprehensions during the Trump administration were then at a 20 year low. Of course, we had caravans coming over in the Trump administration. I remember it well. I went down there. I saw it. There was an influx at one point during the Trump administration, but he was able to input policies that did change that remain in Mexico being a big one. And I think a lot of people are just tired of watching tens of thousands of people come in a week and then saying, yeah, we need Congress to act. Yes, but there's got to be something that we can do in the interim to speed up the process of these asylum hearings, get more asylum judges on the border in real time. This wait two to three years and have two kids, it's just not working out. It's not sustainable. And unfortunately, it seems like a lot of Democrats, and maybe I'm wrong, they think the solution is more money, more funding. That's certainly what the governors and the mayors want. They want more funding to take care of these people. Whereas on the Republican side, we want to stop these people from coming in in mass because we realize that at some point the money is going to dry up and the American people should be first in line for that money, not 500,000 Venezuelans that are now going to be protected given work permits, but of course protected from deportation. That's just so frustrating for us on the right. We have to take care of our own communities. And you mentioned East Palestine. That's obviously an area where we agree, you know, we have, we should not have our U.S. citizens facing, you know, the issue where our our drinking water isn't clean. That should be an A number one priority across the board. Um, because, you know, to mu- whom much is given, much is expected. We have seen the world depend on the U.S. in a way that, you know, it's it's kind of a double-edged sword because on one side, you know, we have 
the U.S. has great responsibility. We have great power. We have our currency as the trading currency around the world. We have um, power that uh, a lot of countries would love to have. That comes with a lot of responsibility. So we have been this beacon and people have come to the U.S. Now, I think we can do both. And there are some Republicans saying that we can do both. We can both protect our own border, make sure that we have a way that people who are seeking opportunity, who have been victim of their own country's um, absolute abhorrent uh, you know, practices, where they can come to America. And Venezuela is one of those where you saw a socialist leader come in with Hugo Chavez. I mean, I met Hugo Chavez at the Summit of Americas. I remember it was just kind of ridiculous. He came to present President Obama a book to tell President Obama how to govern. And I can promise you President Obama was not listening to Hugo Chavez. Hugo Chavez took his country, which was a thriving democracy, and turned it into a complete backwater socialist uh, regime that had no food on shelves. It was, you know, he's massively corrupt. He, his successor is massively corrupt. And, you know, we face this really... I think precarious situation where we've seen in Venezuela, you know, because of their problems, all of the Venezuelans who, you know, in some cases, Jonathan Jacobowitz is a good friend of mine. He was a filmmaker calling out, um, you know, this uh, taking money from Hugo Chavez. He got to the U.S the US after he was persecuted. So very much he was persecuted. He came to the US and he's been hugely successful. He had, you know, Hands of Stones was was a very popular uh, you know, film that he produced here in the US. That helps the US economy. We've, you know, obviously brought someone here who wants to speak for their own um, rights and that's but Joanna. That is, that is one of these people are coming over, and you know, God bless them. I, I'm sure that they are coming from horrible situations. I don't blame them. If I could get to a better country and I saw the borders being wide open, and I was going to get a cell phone and a hotel room and three meals a day, I'd probably do it too. So I understand the plight of these people. But when we look at these people coming in, millions at this point, you know, maybe every one in a few might have some skills or might have the ability to earn and might be able to support themselves here in the U.S., but a lot of them, we have to be honest, we're importing poverty. A lot of these people don't speak English. A lot of these people, they might have a trade or a skill, but a lot of these people do not. So it's going to be a huge suck and a huge drain on our economy, and there's going to be a time when Americans are going to need those jobs. You know, you went through the Obama administration when we were at the end of the recession or in the middle of the recession. You know there's going to be Americans who are going to need those jobs at some point. I think we're still living high on the hog with that stimulus and COVID money, but that's going to run out at some point, and people are going to have to get back to work on some of these jobs that they think are beneath them, and illegal immigrants are going to fill them, or they're just going to be loitering the streets as they are in New York City doing nothing. So I'm concerned about the future of our country, but I do want to move on to another topic which is Kamala Harris. So she has a new job. Um, speaking of the border, she's doing a fantastic job there, but she's been tasked with yet another responsibility. Let's listen to Vice President Kamala Harris. Tell us what's up next on her to-do list. Hey, everybody. So I have some big news to share. We are announcing the creation of the first ever White House Office of Gun Violence Prevention. And we are doing this work in large part because of the activism, the organizing, the marching, the voting of all of you leaders, be it students, parents, teachers, community leaders, who understand that living free from gun violence should be a right. So we're gonna work on this together. We're gonna to continue to fight for reasonable gun safety laws and for the ability of all people to live their best lives free from fear, free from violence. So my initial thought is if she handles her new job as guns are, anything like she handles her job as borders are, we are all at risk of being murdered. That is my honest concern. What do you think? Do you think she's up for this challenge? I think she's been handed a pretty unfortunate uh, position here because she's not going to be able to please anyone, right, Tommy? I mean, if we look at um, the the gun violence in this country, you and I can probably both agree that neither of us want our children in our schools to ever face a, you know, a, a suicide attempt, really. Most of these kids are going there to, to commit suicide. And, and then 
we have our children under attack calling us and, you know, just desperate. Um, that shouldn't happen in our country. And it has as much to do with mental health as it does the easy access to weapons for people who shouldn't have them because they have mental health crises or other things going on. Um, she's not going to ultimately probably be able to get a lot done though. So she's been given kind of a really unfortunate hand here because yeah, you can try to get your, you know, really rally the base. And I see this a lot in politics of both the right and the left. You can try to rally your base and get them all worked up. But when you can't actually do something to change the laws because you need Congress to do that, it's probably going to not serve her well. And um, I'm not sure why she wanted to take it on, but uh, it does seem like they're trying to give her more of the activist portfolio, I guess, to get uh, that popularity with that base. And I'm not sure it's going to work. Yeah, I don't think it's going to work either, but there's a couple of things to this. One, I think that she's given these tasks in activism because she doesn't really do anything constructive when it comes to policy or advocating for policy. She doesn't really get her hands dirty. She posts a lot of selfies. She does a lot of photo ops, but she doesn't really do much of anything. And I know that there are some on the left that will argue that the vice president doesn't do much of anything, but we both know that she was handed a fantastic opportunity to really lead in this administration, and she has failed to do that. So part of that is of her own making, but I wonder your thoughts on this. Do you think that Joe Biden or whoever controls Joe Biden, do you think they're purposely trying to sabotage Kamala Harris by giving her these tasks that they know that she can't do anything about? No, I don't think so. And Joe Biden does control Joe Biden. He was our vice president. So of course he was very frustrated. I think a lot that he didn't get to do more. Uh, Mike Pence has talked about that too, the job of the vice president. They basically don't do anything. Um, I, I think actually Anita Dunn, who's been working on kind of making sure that Kamala can work on the issues she cares about, probably sees an issue a former attorney general was very involved in in California and thinks this is you know an area where she can own it. She wants to own it. Um, I don't know if they thought through, you know, <laughs> what's next? What can she actually do? Gavin Newsom, of course, is talking about a um, he wants to see a constitutional amendment to give the ability to regulate guns, um, you know, more power in this country. I, I think this is one where, again, you know, if you have families who have guns and respect the power of weaponry, and I, you know, come myself, my dad's an NRA member, I'm familiar with that lifestyle. You don't think that, you know, there should be some child who can run into a school with a gun and shoot their peers. So there's probably ability to compromise. I think, unfortunately, our politics of the day has forced the extremism on both sides. And so it's very unlikely you're going to see Kamala Harris bring people together. And that's unfortunate. But I think that's unfortunate for both of our parties that we're at that position where we'd rather just get everybody worked up instead of actually present solutions. Yeah, I think part of the problem is there's a lot of uh, distrust, mistrust, whatever you want to call it, amongst the American people because of the two and a half years of COVID tyranny, wherein our rights were stripped of us. So when we hear people talk about how they want common sense gun safety, we kind of liken that to two weeks to flatten the curve. And there's not a lot of trust. And there's a lot of, of a lot of folks like myself who are very concerned about what that looks like as little infringements become bigger infringements and then it becomes a confiscation. I'm sure Gavin Newsom would love that, but you've brought up his name several times. I've brought up his name several times um, throughout the last year because I believe he's going to be the Democrat nominee. But you have to tell me this too. He's going to be at the GOP debate, of course, in California, his backyard this week. He's going as a Biden surrogate, but uh, I call BS on that. I think this is, a, yet again, another soft launch. For the last six months, he's been soft launching his campaign. I think that there is a bigger purpose for Gavin Newsom to be at that debate. And I'm wondering if you're seeing the writing on the wall as I do. So I think Gavin has wanted to be president since he was, you know, a young man, married to Kimberly Guilfoyle, laying across a rug, um, you know, plotting the path there. I I think this week he probably is going as a Biden surrogate because Joe Biden is going to be the Democratic nominee. He has said that he wants that position again, and the Democrats aren't going to strip him of that. 
And so, you know, Joanna, we- why? Why not? I mean, the polls, we can talk about Trump all day long. I don't yeah. think Trump is the strongest candidate, but you have challengers, of course, to Donald Trump. I understand it's a different situation. Uh, we've got Biden as the incumbent. But why do Democrats, why are they not stepping up and saying, OK, we need somebody else? You said they won't strip him of it. But do you think they would be wise to put up a challenge, we know RFK is a challenge, but not really. Do you think that the Democrats and the DNC and the powers that be, because we know and you know they control everything, do you think that they need to step in and make some changes here? Because the polls, even with Donald Trump, who is obviously a flawed candidate, not looking so hot for Joe right now. The expectation that anyone's puppeteering this, I think, is probably giving the Democrats too much credit. Um, no one is puppeteering in the background. You know, the DNC has really always operated. And I saw this with President Obama in the sense of whoever is the party head when President Obama won against Hillary Clinton, we took over. Um, they have the power. So right now, Joe Biden has the power. I think what you see, Tommy, is there's um, kind of a loveless marriage uh, between Democrats and Joe Biden because they believe that Joe Biden will win um, against Donald Trump. Not everyone, certainly not all voters, but they saw, you know, when they put up Hillary Clinton and she didn't win against Donald Trump, they know Joe Biden has defeated him before. I think everyone has concerns in the Democratic Party about uh, Donald Trump. And, um, you know, they don't know exactly what Donald Trump uh, will do, but there's certainly like a frustration of, um, Democrats that they don't want to see Trump in president the presidency again. And so uh, what they see is they say, OK, Joe Biden has won. And not only that, he's actually gotten some things that they've wanted behind the scenes done for them to the extent of infrastructure uh, bill. I mean, President Trump wanted that. He did get that done. They want to see more of that progress. I mean, you're talking about Gavin. I think he's slowly but surely plotting what he has done in the state of California to run for national office. Last week, he was touting that he expanded paid family leave and early childhood um, education here in the state. They're always plotting. That's the whole thing about politicians. I think that's why a lot of people have been drawn to these people who aren't career politicians, whether it's Donald Trump, Vivek Ramaswamy obviously is catching on. Um, I think the Democrats are still saying they want someone who has experience in government to um, you know, be the head of their party. And so for most Democratic leaders, they've already you know, said they're going to go with Joe Biden and you're not going to see a real challenge. They also think it would make him weaker against Trump and they don't want that. Yeah, I think that the best bet that the Democrats have for 2024 is Trump being the nominee and people going out to vote not for Biden, but against Trump casting their vote for Joe simply because they don't want Trump to be the president. That's why I'm concerned about having Donald Trump as the head of my ticket. That's why I have res reservations and concerns about that, though I loved him as my president in 2016. I, I am very concerned about that. But I do think that when the Democrats decide that Joe's out, they will decide that Joe is out, just like they decided when Bernie was going to be pulled off the stage by the hook. I mean, Democrats came together. They rallied around Joe simply to keep Bernie out of that conversation. So I know, and I don't give Democrats a lot of credit, but as far as being strategic and manipulative, a lot of credit. Much smarter on that side than we are. Much more cohesive, much more unified. They run like a machine. We don't. I admire that about the Democrat Party. But then you've got Gavin Newsom just announced today. Gavin Newsom is going to debate Ron DeSantis, of course, on Fox News. It's supposed to go down at the end of November, reportedly in Georgia. What is your take on that? The two, I guess, heavyweight governors, one of them running, one of them probably going to run, going head to head for this debate that we have been uh, Long promise, and it seems like it's finally going to happen. What do you think about that one? I want to watch it. I'm very glad that they're going to debate. I think, you know, they they both, they have power as governors. I think governors often don't get the credit that they deserve as, you know, leaders and uh, future potential leaders. Um, look, I think that both men also have records that they need to talk about, you know, what is the future of America and how does that look like from their states, both states? I mean, California has one out of eight Americans live in the state of California. And Florida has seen a massive influx of people from throughout the U.S. moving to Florida. So they're obviously attractive states in their own right, and they have very different perspectives. So 
I'm really excited to watch that debate. I will 100% be watching it from, you know, on Fox or anywhere. I want to see what they have to say. But I also, I think that, you know, it's a lot of attention is given to the presidency and um, often the city council members, the people who are closest to us, they actually have the most effect on us. So I'm really glad that some of our media organizations are prioritizing those conversations at the local level, more at the state um, level and see those governors debating the future of America. I can't wait. I've already asked if I could please, please be in attendance. I care actually far more about that debate than any other debate on the calendar, at least at this point. I think it's going to be a fantastic night, and I think that it's going to be a great matchup. I have long said this. I, I can't stand Gavin Newsom. Um, I actually detest Gavin Newsom, but I do think that the American people deserve a stark contrast and choice, and I believe that they deserve a Gavin Newsom versus a Ron DeSantis to be placed in front of them and to choose their path forward in this country. I don't think we need to go with 80-something-year-old Joe and 80-something-year-old Trump and relitigate that and rehash that. I think the American people need a better choice. And as much as I don't like Gavin, I would like to see Gavin and DeSantis not only debate, but I would like to see them run head-to-head in 2024. And I'm still holding out that that's going to happen. But we'll wait and see. I have you on the record as saying Joe's going to be the nominee, so we'll wait and see how that's going to pan out. Thank you as always for spending so much time with me and I hope to have you back soon.